Why is the sermon coming so early in the service? And it is because we're going to do the service a little bit differently today. We want there to be time after the message for us to just enter into, yeah, a season of worship, but also uh, specifically a season of prayer. And that's one of the, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning is prayer. Uh, but before I just dive into that, I want to read to you something that, that I just read this morning. And, and it's the Apostle Paul, and he's writing in the book of Ephesians in chapter 3. And this is what he prayed over the people of God. And this is what I prayed over you this morning. And, and he, he just prayed that uh, the people of God might comprehend. And listen to this. He talks about the depth, the breadth, the width, the height of the love of God. And then he says this, and I pray uh, that you will know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And it just dawned on me this morning, here's here's what Paul was praying. And this is my prayer for you. And I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into the message. Uh, The more we understand just how much God really does love us. And some of you may have come this morning doubting God's love. You've been asking him to do something and he's been ignoring you. You've asked him to do something and he hasn't done it. You've been asking him to do something good and something instead bad has happened in your life. And, and now you're doubting the love of God. Paul prayed that, that the people of God, and my prayer for you is that you will know the width, the breadth, the depth, the height of God's love for you. Because it's when we understand how much God loves us that we are filled with, listen to these words, the fullness of God. It's when we understand the love of God that we are formed in the ways of God. And so that really is my prayer for you, that you would understand today when you leave here, you'd be under no illusions. God, you are crazy mad in love with me. And I want the fullness of God formed in me. Will you just make that your prayer with me right now? Close your eyes. Don't close your eyes either way. But just say, Lord Jesus, show me the depth of your love. And Lord, form the fullness of who you are in me. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, uh, we are in this sermon series that we're just talking about for, what we're for. And it's so easy, even for us. I'm not talking about what the world does to us. I'm talking about what we do to ourselves. Students, think about this. If you're not careful, you will allow your friends and just your own thoughts in your own head convince you that that to follow Jesus is to be against this, this, and this, and this, and this. And then pretty soon you'll be convinced to follow Jesus means I have to swear off of having any kind of fun ever, but at least I get to go to heaven when I die. And hopefully that'll be fun, you know? And, and, And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You want to summarize everything that is taught in this book? You can summarize it like this. Two fours. Four. We are four. Loving God. Adoring God. Pursuing God. Yielding to God. We are four. Understanding the depth of his love so that the fullness of God might be formed in us. And we are four. Loving others as Jesus has loved us. And if we are really for loving God and loving others, then it follows very logically that we are for prayer. Because think about it. It's when we are praying that we are most connected to the love of God. And it's when we are praying that God then begins to form our heart, fill our heart with love for other people. So I think it's highly important that we Declare together, we are for prayer. I read a book this summer that, that it's by Pete Gregg, How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People. Man, I, I, I read the title and I thought, I've got to read this book because I am a normal person and I need a simple guide for how to pray and enhance my own time with the Lord. And I read this baby and I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm encouraging you to get this book. 
I encourage you to read this book. We'll be selling some in the atrium today. When you leave, you can get uh, when you leave, uh, you can get it online. But I encourage you. I'm going to be asking the staff to read this book this summer, uh, this fall with me, uh, because it had such a huge impact upon my own time spent with the Lord on a daily basis. And in the book, he uses, as far as the guide uh, for our prayer life, he uses the Lord's Prayer. And that's right up my alley because that's the guide that I use for praying every single day. And so that's going to be the text that we have today as well. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I'm going to ask you not to read a text, but I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Because it says, pray then like this. And then Jesus tells us how to pray. So I'm inviting you not to read a single thing. I'm inviting you to pray and let's pray this in unison. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for praying with me and praying together uh, and, and for honoring God's word. Hey, listen, one of the things that I loved about what Pete Gregg does in this book is he, he gave me a, a different angle. I pray the Lord's Prayer pretty much every single morning. I pray through it, and it's the outline, but he gave me a new outline concerning the Lord's Prayer, just using the word pray as an acrostic, and it is pause, rejoice, ask, yield. We're going to look at that this morning, and I'm going to give you, hopefully, some ideas, thoughts as it comes to that, but again, I strongly urge you to get the book, and you'll get a lot more ideas and thoughts and insights that I believe will enhance your time with the Lord. But first, Pete Gregg suggests this. When it comes to prayer, begin by pausing. Now, I love that, not because Pete Gregg wrote it in a book, but because that's what God commanded us to do. Have you ever read what the psalmist wrote, be still and know that I am God. When we come before Almighty, it is a really, really, really good idea. Students, I want you to hear this. Instead of just rushing in and just, hey God, I really need this and I got, I'm in a hurry and I gotta go, but, but to just instead come and you pause and you get still and you know that I am God. You just say, God, will you just slow my mind down enough, my emotions down enough to recognize that I am in the presence of the holy. See, it's when we pause and we get still before God that we can really center our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the one who really is God. Uh, for me, uh, the way I pray is I read scripture before I pray because I always want to listen to God before I ask God to listen to me. And uh, one morning, a couple of weeks ago, I read this uh, during my prayer time before I prayed, before I paused before the Lord. And it says this, the floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. And the floods lift up their roaring. Do you ever find yourself in life where you just feel like you are surrounded by noise and you can't hear yourself think, much less hear the words of God? But listen to the next part. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. I read that and other things and then I prayed and during my pause, I'm just repeating, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And the Lord brings up that verse to my mind. But I didn't get an image in my mind of, of waves crashing and thunder. Instead, I, I just had the image of the voices of the world that are shouting and the world is shouting out its threats, its mockery, its doubts, its profanity. And I'm just sitting there in the midst of that and I remember how the psalmist said, you, O oh Lord, are mightier than the waves or the thunder. And I just began to pray, be still and know that I am God. Lord, will you silence the voices of the world so that I might hear your voice in these next moments? 
It's amazing what happens when you begin to pause before you pray. That's when you begin to see with the prophet Isaiah, the Lord high and lifted up. Pete Gregg writes in his book, if we want to get better at hearing the one who speaks in a still small voice, we must befriend silence. He also writes this, the best way to start praying is to actually stop praying. Before you pray, it's a really good idea to pause and just say, be still and know that I am God. Lord, let me sit here until I recognize that I am in the presence of the holy. And then rejoice, pray, pause, rejoice. What is it that we rejoice over? We go to the Lord's Prayer to discover that. Our Father, rejoice that he is your Father in heaven. Rejoice that he is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Rejoice that his name is hallowed. Uh, let's break that down. When we pray, it's really good to just stop and rejoice and say, thank you, oh God, for being my Father. Now, this is not a heavenly handshake. This is not a polite hello while you're racing into the presence of God. And, oh, our Father, uh, I gotta talk to you. And, and then you get down to business. No, this is, this is, I think, a huge part of prayer. I'm telling you, it is. I'm not just saying this. It is one of the most significant parts of my prayer every single morning because I think I suffer from a lot of conviction or a lot of guilt. Uh, I feel like Paul most days, as in pretty well every single day, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The bad that I don't want to do, I do. Wretched man, who is going to set me free from this body of death? So I come into the presence of God and I pray, our Father, and all I'm thinking of is the things that I want to to do that I haven't done, the things I don't want to do that I have done. And then it's so comforting to go, our father, you're my dad. And I'm still your son. And you still love me more than I love my own kids. And I would give my life for my kids. And that's how much you love me. In spite of my flaws and my faults and my failures, you still love me. I'm telling you, it'll revolutionize your, chair, your prayer life if you will just start with our Father and you recognize that God loves you more than you love your kids. God loves you more than your parents love you. And that's the depth of his love for you. Our Father, rejoice. God, thank you for being my Father for making me your child through faith in Jesus. In heaven, now that's pretty cool. That's something to rejoice over, right? Pause, rejoice. What do you rejoice over? You rejoice that God is in heaven. You rejoice that God is God and you are not, amen? You rejoice that God is large and in charge. You rejoice that God is not your buddy, buddy, that God is bigger than anything you're gonna face that day. I've got this mantra that I've prayed. I've prayed it for, I don't know how many years, 20, 30 years now, but every time I pray, Pray in heaven, our Father in heaven, I will pray, my Lord and my God, before whom I bow and to whom I submit, because it reminds me that he is my king and I am his subject. He is my king and he leads and I follow, amen? And so we pray and we say, in heaven, you are God and I'm not. I love the way Pete Gregg writes it in his book. One of the main differences between you and God is that God doesn't think he is you. How often do we come thinking this is all on me and I gotta fix this and I gotta take care of this. Rejoice that God is the God of the universe and this God of the universe is your dad who loves you more than you can imagine. Hallowed be your name. What do you rejoice over? You rejoice that God's name is hallowed. I'm convinced when we pray hallowed be your name, what we are praying is, oh God, let your name be sacred on my tongue today. Let your name be hallowed. Don't let me use your name in a vain, flippant way. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, Lordy. Lord, let your name be sacred. Let every thought of you today be a reverent thought. Don't ever let me stand in a position where I think I can lecture you like you're my child and I'm your parent and I'm telling you what you've done wrong and what you haven't done right. Oh, may your name be hallowed. But let me tell you, honestly, in my prayer life, I do a little bit of that, uh, but what I really go to is Thanksgiving because I read years ago, think about it, Acts 
It's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, and how important it is that we spend time thanking God in prayer and, and how I realized that I didn't really spend any time thanking God for much of anything other than thanking him for being my father and being large and in charge, and that was it. And it dawned on me, hallowed be thy name was a great time for me to actually rejoice. That is to thank God. I thank God, and I've told you this before, for my life, my wife, and my strife. You go, well, I don't have a wife. Okay, great. Thank God for your faith, and your family, and your frustrations. Or make up your own acrostic. I didn't read that in the book. But just come up with some categories that you're gonna thank God for every single day. I thank God for my life. He's given, put a place to calling on my life. He's placed a calling on your life. He's put you in an office. He's put you in a neighborhood. He's put you in a family. And you're thanking him for the life that he has given you. Wife, that's a time to thank God for your spouse, if you have one, for your fiance, for the person that you're dating, the person that you will date or will marry. And that's a time to thank God for your family and to pray over your family family. And then I thank God for my strife. Watch out. Don't do that flippantly. But you say, God, I thank you today for the frustrations that I'm going to face because I know that you're going to use those to form me more fully in the ways of Jesus. Here's, Here's what I did the other day. Absolutely, this happened. I read these words. Although he was a son, that's talking about Jesus. He learned obedience through what he suffered. I get to this part in the prayer and I'm thanking God for my life, my wife, and then I get to strife and I say, Lord, thank you for the frustrations that I'm gonna face today, the strife that I'm gonna face today. And and I remember this verse, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And I'm like, God, that really bugs me. It's in the Bible, so I believe it, but I'd hate to say Jesus learned obedience. And and I'm saying, Lord, what's up with that? And then it dawns on me, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Uh, Jesus is God, he's always been God and he always will be God, but when he came to this earth, he became fully human. He was tempted in all points like as we. That's why we know that temptation is not a sin because Jesus was tempted and the sin is following through on the temptation, right? And so I'm sitting there going, okay, I get that. Uh, Temptation, you're tempted. Uh, You grew in wisdom, stature with favor with God and men. Wow. And you also learned obedience and the way the Father taught you, Jesus, obedience The way Jesus was more fully formed, and and I hate to say more fully formed, I think that's heresy, never mind, scratch that. So so the way Jesus learned obedience is through his suffering. And so I'm going, I thank you for my strife. Lord, today, through my suffering, through the frustrations I face, will you form me more fully in the ways of Jesus? Don't you love prayer times? They're so neat and You can be so godly. So fast forward to noon. I have a meeting at the Dallas Baptist Associational Office. It's about 20 minutes away. I had left 20 minutes till noon. I'm on my way. I'm the chairman of the administration committee. Uh, Did I mention I'm the chairman? I'm supposed to be starting the meeting and leading the meeting. And and I, I go down 75. I get on 635. And who knew? 635 at about 11... 40 is a parking lot, not a freeway. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm getting frustrated and anxious. And, and I immediately call Miguel Lopez. If y'all know him, he's on the committee. And I'm saying, Miguel, will you start the meeting? Uh, I'm looking at my navigation apps. I'm not going to get there till about 1230. And, and I'm just like, dad, gum it, doggone it, shoot. And I'm just really getting angry. And I'm just sitting there. And, and then God has the audacity to remind me of what I prayed that morning. <laughs> Lord, thank you for my strife. Use my strife to form me more fully in the ways of Jesus. And so I'm like, okay. Let's try this. Lord, thank you for 635 being a parking lot. (laughs) Will you use this parking lot to form me more fully in the ways of Jesus? And I kid you not, absolute true story. Immediately, I just, just this thought comes to my head and I trust it's from Jesus. Why are you so anxious? You know Miguel Lopez is way smarter than you and he'll do better running the meeting than you will. (laughs) He's going to chair the committee next year. And the truth is, you could turn around and go back to the office, and they really wouldn't miss you that much. And I'm like, kind of hitting me hard here, okay? Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, so? 
tell me, why am I so anxious? Why am I sitting here going, dead gummit, dog gone it, shoot. Ah. And, and, and this word comes to my mind, pride. Because I pride myself on being on time. If you're on time, you're late. My daddy taught me that, and I've practiced that. My, and I'm dependable, and I show up on time. And if I give you my word, my word is my bond, and I follow through, and you can count on me. And I realized it was all about pride. Hey, listen to me. It is amazing what happens if you begin to pray. You begin to rejoice. You begin to say, thank you, God, for my strife. Thank you for the frustrations that I'm going to face today. Because I know that it's through, oh, through suffering that I'm going to learn greater obedience. It's through my frustration that I'm going to be formed more fully in the ways of Jesus. So you pray, you pause, you rejoice, and then you ask, you ask. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. When you start breaking down the Lord's prayer, Do you know we're commanded to pray, give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us, let your kingdom come, let your will be done? You begin to break that down and you realize God's telling you to ask for, ask for food, protection, forgiveness, for there to be regime change. I mean, what do you think you're praying when you pray, your kingdom come, Lord, may your rule come over my thoughts today, over my tongue today, over my relationship uh, on this date, my relationship with my fiance, my relationship... uh, with my wife, my husband, my relationship with my kids. Lord, let your kingdom, your rule come at the office. Let your rule come in my neighborhood with my neighbors. Lord, today, let me live under your good, kind, gracious rule. May I recognize that you're my king and that my job is to follow you today and show people great glimpses of what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God under the rule of a great king my your kingdom come lord let me do your will today and lord let your kingdom come in my kids lives let your kingdom come in my co-workers lives lord let their life be radically changed today through the work of your spirit lord use me if you want to but what i'm praying for today is regime change i'm asking your kingdom to come in this nation your kingdom to come over this whole earth Do you realize when you pray, you're praying for regime change? God said, ask for food, protection, forgiveness, regime change. Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. James said, you do not have because you do not ask. Mark in his gospel tells the story of blind Bartimaeus. Do you remember that story? Bartimaeus was blind. And Jesus came by. And blind Bartimaeus begins to cry out, Jesus, Jesus. And the whole crowd's going, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. You're a loser. You're nobody. Jesus is really important. He doesn't have time for people like you. Shut up, blind Bartimaeus. But Jesus heard blind Bartimaeus cry out. And Jesus stopped and Jesus asked a question. What do you want me to do for you? No doubt everybody in the crowd cringed. Oh, Jesus. It's blind Bartimaeus. Everybody can see it's, he's blind. He, Jesus, G- Jesus. Jesus, it's kind of awkward for you to ask him what, what he wants you to do. Everybody knows what he wants you to do, but Jesus doesn't listen to crowds, does he? So he asked the question, and I love blind Bartimaeus. He doesn't, he doesn't miss a beat. He doesn't go, duh. <laughs> Instead, he goes, the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And in that moment, in that moment, Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus and he taught us. It's not enough to sit silently in the crowd waiting for a miracle. We have to ask. He expects us to ask. Pete Gregg writes this. We can't control God in prayer because he is God and we are not. But he does allow us to influence him. Here's the reality. We can sit down every day and pray, pause, rejoice, ask. 
God to work a miracle in our life and in the lives of the people around us. Ask for food, provision, protection. Ask God to bring about regime change in our, our relationships, in our home. We can ask or we can just sit there silently and tell God we're too busy to ask. And if we do, here's what happens. Jesus passes on by and works a miracle in another place and in another person's life because he said he wants us to ask. So we pray, we pause, we rejoice, we ask, and then we yield, yield. Here's what we pray. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The word used there, debts, is also the word sin. It actually means something which is owed, due, an obligation to pay. Do you realize you owe, and I want a verbal response on this, you owe God perfect obedience. He's the king of kings. And he created us. So we owe it to him to live under his good, kind rule and be obedient, perfectly obedient to our king. Do you realize you owe that, yes or no? And it's okay if you say no or just stay silent. I just want to know, do you realize that? We owe that. Second question, you do realize you've not paid God what you owe. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. And so we pray, since we know that we've not paid God what we owe, we pray every day, forgive us our debts. The word forgive means to wipe the slate clean. And what we are doing is we are yielding our life to Jesus every single day. We are saying, God, I am so sorry. I've not paid you today what I owe you. I've not paid you perfect obedience. And I am asking you to forgive me, but I am reorienting my life back under your good, kind, gracious rule. I'm declaring yet again, you are my king and I am your child and I will follow you and obey you this day. See, when we pray, forgive us as we forgive others around us. We're saying, I yield my life back to you. I think it was actually Pope Francis and it's probably the first time you've ever heard me quoting a pope who prayed, God never tires of forgiving us. We just get tired of asking him to. We go, God, I'm sorry for the millionth time. And I bet you're sick of forgiving me, aren't you? I'm just gonna quit asking you. He doesn't get tired of forgiving us. We just get tired of asking him to. But here, God's grace is greater than all of our sin. And God invites us to come every single day and say, yep, God, I didn't pay you what I owed you yesterday and I probably won't today, but I'm telling you, it is my desire, it is my intent, it is my commitment today to yield and to follow and to obey and you forgive me, I'll forgive others and I'll walk under your good, kind, gracious rule. Here's what I'm saying in this message. We are for prayer. That's as a follower of Jesus, we're for prayer. Let me tell you what God does when we start praying. God influences us and he influences the people around us. I saw a cool, I mean, honestly encouraging example of this uh, about a week back. I'm praying in my office and I'm praying and, and God just brings to mind a certain person and, and, and just in the middle of my prayer, and this is not that unusual for me, God just really, I mean, you, you ought to text them, you ought to tell them you're praying for them. And I'm like, okay, excuse me. And I'll get my phone out and I'll text them and just, hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you right now, blah, 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 blah. Well, what I didn't realize is that Kim praying at home at the very same time 
It has the very same impression to pray. We've not talked about this. We've not coordinated this, planned this. I'm at the office. She's at home. She's praying. And she just really feels led to, to pray for this person. And God really convicts her totally separate from me. You ought to text this person and let them know that you're praying for them. And so this person then thinking that we're probably praying together, uh, texts us both back and says, thank you so much for the prayers and starts telling us some of what's going on in their life that day, what's going on that life that afternoon and how critical the prayers are and how much they're grateful for the prayers. And, and I couldn't wait to get home and go, that is so cool. And I'm telling you, in the midst of that, God encouraged my faith. He encouraged Kim's faith. He encouraged our prayer life. And he worked in ways that I can't even share with you in the life of the person for whom we were praying that very afternoon. It's amazing what happens when we pray. God doesn't allow us to control him through prayer, but he does allow us to have influence. And when we pray, we see the influence of God in our life and the lives of the people around us. So what am I asking you to do in this message? Well, we're gonna spend some time in prayer today before we leave. But before we go there, even as the team comes up, I'm gonna ask you to open up your mind and your heart to prayer once again. Maybe you've not prayed in a long time. Maybe your prayers are sporadic. Maybe your prayers are really, really quick because you just have a hard time believing that the God of the universe is actually listening to you and if he listens to you that he'll do anything in response to your prayer. But what if, what if it is actually true? What if God really did prompt me to pray for someone uh, and, and prompted Kim to pray for someone? What if he prompted us both to text that person? What if he really did... Uh, influence what happened that very afternoon in that person's life because Kim and I were both praying along with many others, no doubt. What if it's true that blind Bartimaeus, had he stayed silent, that Jesus would have just passed him by and worked a miracle in someone else's life? I'm asking you to open your heart and your mind up to prayer. Because as a follower of Jesus, I can tell you, you are for prayer. You are designed for prayer. You are formed for prayer. You may not practice it, but I'm telling you, you are for prayer if you are a follower of Jesus. So I'm asking you to open your heart up to it. And now I'm going to ask you as well to engage in a season of prayer. The worship team is going to lead us in worship, but I'm inviting you to ignore them. Just let that be background worship. And pick a pause or pick rejoicing or pick asking or pick yielding. Pick one of the four areas and just zero in on that. Hey, by the way, I do believe worshiping God is a part of prayer. It's called rejoicing. It's called worshiping. Hallowed be your name. So if you want to spend your time worshiping, feel free. Dive in. And also this altar is going to be open and there are going to be prayer partners here so that if you need somebody to pray over you, uh, listen, there's somebody down here who'll pray over you. And, and the Lord's Supper, uh, we're inviting you to come down and grab the elements and take the Lord's Supper. And you just do it on your own. We're not going to lead it jointly. But remember what you're doing when you take the Lord's Supper. You're rejoicing. You're saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. That you didn't just sit in heaven and wish us luck. You came. This is my body, take and eat. And Jesus, you shed your blood as payment for my sin so that my sin could be forgiven and so that I could live with you as my king in your kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming and dying. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being my father and letting me be your child through faith. So we've got about 10 minutes. I invite you, don't just slip out. If you want to slip out, slip out. But I invite you not to. I invite you to just, let's spend some time pausing, rejoicing, asking, yielding, I invite you to spend a moment at this altar. Take the supper. Will you do that? Let's pray. And then we're going to stand. And we're going to respond in prayer.
Lord, thank you for teaching us how to pray. You formed us for prayer. Thank you for not just saying good luck. Figure it out. You better do it. You said, let me take you by the hand. Let me show you how. Lord, may we not just be hearers of the word. Lord, I don't want this to be a sermon that people evaluate. Hey, good, bad, and no, no, Lord. I just pray that your spirit would form us in your ways in these moments. Lord, bring us to a place where we recognize we're formed for prayer and we are for prayer. Lord, let us renew our commitment to pray. Thank you for giving us this book by Pete Gregg. Thank you for giving us your word. And thank you for giving us this moment to put into practice what you've told us. In Jesus' name, amen.